L'Enfant Terrible was a moniker often used to describe the brilliant Alexander McQueen. The young generation would hear the name Alexander McQueen and think of thick soled sneakers. However, as history has proven, the Alexander McQueen label is much more than that. Its founder was a genius and a rebel that didn't just create fashion shows, he created art itself. In this video, we'll talk about the man behind the label, Alexander McQueen, and his thought-provoking designs. We'll also try to figure out why this promising designer eventually took his own life and how the subversive label eventually became a favorite of British royalty. Lee Alexander McQueen was born in London, England on the 17th of March 1969. His father, Ronald McQueen, was a taxi driver, while his mother, Joyce McQueen, worked as a social science teacher. Lee was the youngest of six children, so as you can imagine, he didn't have it easy as a young boy. Right from elementary school, he was already fascinated with fashion. He would draw dresses and end up using whatever pieces of material he could find to make dresses for his three sisters. By 16, Lee would become so obsessed with fashion that he dropped out of school. Coming from a humble background of working-class parents and with no background in arts training, we can all agree that this was a risky path. Lee wasted no time enrolling at the Newham College in London, where he began taking professional tailoring courses. This would be the first of many times the world would see this brilliant designer defy all expectations. Once he completed his course at Newham, he went on to Anderson and Shepherd, where he would serve as an apprentice for Savile Row tailors. These tailors were so good that Savile Row Street was known to be the home of the greatest bespoke tailors in England. To become even more rounded, he would move on to other stores on Savile Row. He learned pattern cutting during his apprenticeship with Jeeves and Hawks and learned the basics of theatrical costume design while working at Angels and Bermans. We can assume that his time at Angels and Bermans helped shape his career trajectory. This distinct style of tailoring must have developed his knack for the dramatic. During his time at Savile Row, he had the opportunity to work on suits for Mikhail Gorbachev and even Prince Charles. There are rumors that while working on a suit for Prince Charles, Lee stitched some very vulgar words onto the lining of the future King of England's jacket. Nobody knows if Lee was making a political statement or if he was just trying to be funny. Whatever the case, Lee was quite defiant. By the age of 20, Lee had already done so much. He'd not just honed his skills at Savile Row, but he'd also worked for big names in fashion, such as Japanese designer Koji Tatsuno and the Italian Romeo Gigli. At 21, Lee would try to channel the same confidence that made him drop out of school by applying for a job as a teacher at the Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design. Clearly, he was too young to teach his peers, but he did it anyway. Bobby Hilson, who was head of the master's course, agreed to meet with him due to his impressive portfolio, and she eventually encouraged him to enroll as a student instead. He accepted her offer and began his master's program. In 1992, the world would see the culmination of all Lee had learned, not just from college but also from his time during his previous internships. This debut was his graduate collection called Jack the Ripper Stalks His Victims. This collection featured some very distinct modern takes on Victorian fashion. Experimenting further, Lee attached locks of his own hair into the fabrics he used. This was a huge reference to two trends in the Victorian era. The first was how prostitutes often sold locks of their hair, and then how people often held onto the locks of dead loved ones. This collection made a huge first impression on the fashion industry, so much so that Isabella Blow, a magazine editor and stylist, paid £5,000 to buy the entire collection. By doing this, Blow had helped finance Lee's fashion label. She even advised him to drop Lee and professionally go with the name Alexander McQueen. She also let him live and work from her basement so he would not have extra expenses. In 1993, Alexander, as he was already known by then, acquired a studio space in Hoxton Square. His first collection for his label was called The Taxi Driver, named after the Martin Scorsese film, and possibly also because of his father, who had the same profession. The collection was presented in Paris at the Ritz Hotel. Unfortunately, only those at the presentation would see his work because the pieces were stolen right after the show before they could even be photographed. Even in such unfortunate circumstances, Alexander would go on to release many more outstanding and thought-provoking collections in his time. In 1994, his solo runaway show, Nihilism, birthed a silhouette. 
He's now seen as the father of the low-rise pants, which he called the Bumsters. These pants were not only very low, and also had to reveal the bum so much that the models had to wax before they could wear them. In 1995, the Highland Rape Collection featured clothes splashed in fake blood and its models covered in bruises and messy hair. Often misunderstanding what Lee was going for, people would constantly criticize his work. He was even tagged as the designer who hates women and l'enfant terrible of fashion. In his defense, Alexander didn't just love to reference a particular era in his work, but also wanted to portray his women as strong warriors, as opposed to romantic and fragile like other designers were doing. In 1996, after he released the Dante Collection, he won the award for the British Designer of the Year. He was also appointed as a creative director for Givenchy, but that didn't stop him from occasionally designing for his own label. When his five-year contract with Givenchy was completed in 2001, McQueen left and was able to entirely focus on his brand. His time with Givenchy is said to have been so demanding that we can deduce that this was the cause of his drug addiction. McQueen was also known for his creative and brilliant runway shows. He featured an amputee model that wore wooden legs in his 1999 collection called Number 13. At the end of that same show, a model wearing a white dress stood on a rotating platform and was splashed in black and yellow paint by two car painting robotic arms. By the time the display was done, the dress had gotten a new look. Another iconic runway show was for the 2001 Voss Collection. The press was seated outside a double-sided mirror while the models walked inside the box, not seeing the audience but themselves in the mirror. Even more iconic are his runway show finales. Earlier in 1998, while walking the runway, a model was caught in the middle of a ring of fire during the Joan Collection show. In 2005, the concept of the It's Only a Game runway show was a life-sized game of chess. In 2006, during the Widows of Culloden show, a hologram of Kate Moss was featured as a ghost widow. And as if it was a premonition of sorts, in 2008, Isabella Blow committed suicide. Though they'd become estranged, McQueen was hit hard by this loss. His grief inspired the 2008 La Dame Bleu summer collection. The 2009 Horn of Plenty for winter collection in interviews, McQueen would say that he wanted this collection to mark the end of the first half of his career. The collection definitely delivered what it was supposed to do. The collection featured some popular silhouettes of the 20th century, such as Chanel's tweed and Dior's new look designed in his own style. In 2010, McQueen released The Bone Collector, which turned out to be his last epic collection. This menswear collection featured perfectly tailored suits with a motif of bones and ropes. Sadly, Alexander McQueen hung himself three weeks later and a few days after his mother's funeral. He died on the 11th of February 2010. This was the first high-profile suicide in the fashion industry. As could be deduced from his suicide note, McQueen had always suffered from acute anxiety and depression. This was eventually compounded by his addictions to cope with extreme stress. Whatever demons he was fighting, the most beautiful but tragic thing about his life was that he knew his purpose very early on. This was a feat not all adults can boast of. After his death, the caring conglomerate acquired the label and appointed McQueen's right-hand woman and friend Sarah Burton as creative director of Alexander McQueen. She has no doubt done an excellent job ever since. Sarah has stayed true to the ideals, romanticism, and craftsmanship of Alexander McQueen's. However, she moved beyond its dark appeal and added a gentler and more feminine look. In recent years, the labels designed clothes that often juxtaposed femininity with strength, so it's not a surprise to know that Alexander McQueen has evolved into a favorite of the British royals, with Kate Middleton often having been seen out photographed wearing the label's designs, and who will ever forget that wedding dress of hers? Having now become the royal's preferred choice of designer, this phenomenon is nothing short of a plot twist after that Charles fiasco years before. And this subtle endorsement from the younger royals has assured nothing but longevity for the label.